All right, it's good to see you guys tonight. I am so glad to be a part of a ministry, Central Baptist Church, where good singing, we can get up and hear that. And I don't know about you, but I've heard that enough times where it's hard to not to sit there. It's hard to sit there and not join in. Now, some of us might say, you know what? You don't want me to join in. But I, I love singing. I love going back there with my kids, and I heard Gideon a little bit ago, and he was singing, I think it was Glory, Glory in one of the songs. He, was, he caught some of the words. And it's just good to be a part of a ministry where our families can grow up in, where from a young age they can be a part of and they can already be singing songs with us. I'm just so thrilled. The message tonight is going to piggyback on what happened last time I preached. You ever, you ever have something where you're, you get a message, you get instructions, and it doesn't, you don't follow them all the way. My grandpa, he taught me a long time ago that you got to read the directions and you got to follow them. I remember sitting down with him and he'd pull out the directions and I'm like, Grandpa, it's pretty self-explanatory. He's like, oh, no, no, no. You got to pull out those directions and we'd, we'd read through them before we started the project. Sometimes I followed Grandpa's advice and sometimes I didn't. There was one time, I remember, we got a new stroller. And I didn't realize that you could benefit from reading the instructions. But when you, op when, when you read through the instructions, you found out there was this extra door that you could just pop things in the, in the front. And I would never have thought that was a door without reading the directions. But then I remember one time that I didn't read the directions, and I was putting together a mirror for my mom. I had come home from college. I'm like, Mom, what do you need done? And she tell, tells me that she wants this mirror put on the wall. Now, this wasn't any ordinary mirror. This is a mirror that you're supposed to, you want to look at yourself. You want to pull back, and it had this arm in it, then pushed back and was put away. Well, I didn't think that it mattered the rotation of it on the wall. So when I put it on the wall, I screwed it in, got it all set, like, that looks beautiful. When I pulled it out, it was the crookedest mirror you could ever imagine. It came out and it was awful. And my mom, she loves me. And she said, don't change it. It reminds me of you. <sighs> so those kind of things happen. Well, Paul, he wrote a message to the Thess Thessalonians. And in the last time, it was stand, stand fast, keep on. The Lord is coming back. Fix these things in the church. Work hard. Look forward to the coming of the Lord. And not much longer, he hears back that they fixed a few things, but they didn't fix everything. And he writes a letter to clarify some more things that just need to be fixed. And I am... I believe that God wants us, from this passage, to, to really hear that God wants us to endure. Not just stand, but to endure to the very end. And it's a very similar message. But he wants to drive home a couple more points that it was confused in the first part. This is a message to clarify what didn't get under, get, what wasn't made understood the first round. He wants us to see that out of his heart, he is thankful for them. His prayer to them would that God would count them worthy. That they would not be shaken in their faith. He asked them to pray for them in chapter 3. In the latter part of chapter 3, he talk, talks about enduring in your work. And these different things, enduring, continue on, we're going to look at. And in a similar vein to what I did last time, I'm going to work through this passage. I am going to follow up and read through the passage. And God's Word is powerful. That's one thing I'm learning here, is that it's not Chris Merzak. It's not any of us here. It's God's Word. It's God's Word that endures. And even the Apostle Paul, earlier in chapter 2, he talks about how we're supposed to read God's Word and, and, 
and we're supposed to follow through what he has been told by Christ and, and what we have heard of him. And I, I don't know about you, but I'm not old enough to have talked to the Apostle Paul. I got this book where the Apostle Paul has written down the words of Christ to him and wants us to understand what God wants us to know about. This is the, the word of God. And so, leaning back on that, focus in on the first part, chapter 1. The first part is in chapter 1, verse 3. It says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as, as is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you will toward each other abound. Those two part, the first part is your faith groweth. I learned this not too long ago. We, I can't say we learned it, but I taught it. It's the armor of God. And that first part is a shield of faith. I had my boy. We were up there in, in uh, the, the youth room up there, and I had him take his little sword during um, vacation Bible school. And I had put on the shield, and I had him try to strike against me, and he hit my shield. And the shield protected me. Sometimes there's things in here that I don't understand. I don't understand electricity, but it works. I turn on every light that I feel like I should. I don't understand my car, but I turn the key in the ignition and it turns on. I don't understand everything in this book, but I believe it. And as I come across and I read it, this is what God wants us to do. The, the shield of faith. As our faith grows in believing God... And then he says, as our charity, as our care for one another, just abounds, it grows, it just continues on. Those, those are two things that Paul really wants to drive home as a brethren, as a church. He mentions, in, right after that, the very beginning of verse 3, he says, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren. He mentions brethren several times. If you read the Apostle Paul's writings, brethren, the family of God, comes it over and over and over again. I don't know about you, but I've, I've had people in my life not want to hang out with me, not want to be close to me because my stand on God and his word. The liberals, they'll move fast away from you if you start bringing out God's word. You start saying that there's a right and a wrong way to do things because God says it is. You don't have to leave them. They'll leave you quickly. There, but in here, this is our family. This is a place that we can come to and, and feel safe. This is a place we can come to and encourage one another. At least it should be. This is a place where we should be welcomed here. When I have family in town, they're welcome to stay. They're welcome. We, we want our family here. When people come to our church inside this building, there's something said about live stream. But when they are here and they say, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Christ, you are a part of our family. How can we help each other when they're doing what's wrong? Growing up with nine siblings, there were a lot of times where I called my siblings out because I knew what my parents would want. I called them out. We know what God wants. If we read God's word, we can call each other out. But the verse up there speaking the truth in love. It's not for my benefit that I'm telling you this. It's for your benefit. When I would tell my siblings, hey, don't touch the hot stove, do I? Is it really going to hurt me if they touch the hot stove? It's for their benefit. We speak the truth in love because it's for their edification. It's for their building up. Our love aboundeth. Our care for one another. Verse 4, so that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecution and tribulation that ye endure. These three things, the faith groweth, the charity aboundeth, and then ye endure. These are the three things that Paul is thankful for them, that they're growing in these areas. And I think we should be thankful if those things are growing in ours. The things that are happening over 
on the other continent with the Olympics. It's terrible. But they're unsaved individuals. I would expect it of them. They don't know God. Now, am I going to say, you know what? I really want to watch what unsaved people do. Makes me not want to watch them more. But they need the Lord. We, we could spend a lot less time watching things on television just go out and tell people about Jesus Christ. The most of the time when people, really the church grew, it was because people were telling their neighbor. It's not because they got on the internet and started spreading the news. It's because they had connections. And they said, look at what God's changing in my personal life. And they were persecuted for it. But in this next passage, five going further, we see that these Christians face tribulations. They face trials. It wasn't all smooth sailing for them. Let's go ahead and read it. These tribulations, which is manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. Seeing is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the, of the Lord and from the glory of his power? When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Now, wait a second. What was described here was not the same passage that was described in Thessalonians, the first one. Back there, there's a scene where God says he's coming back and he's going to meet his children in the air. He's going to take away his church. But now in this passage, he's talking about the tribulation that is going to come and God's going to be revealed to the world. There's two parts here. There's the rapture of the church in the first Thessalonians. And the second one, God coming back to judge the earth. Brother Joe, earlier today, the judgment of God. God is coming for us, but then God is going to judge the world. The wickedness, the things that they do. And it is our job right now to, to not stand gawking as if Christ is going to come back today and waiting there standing. Remember when Jesus was taken up and the disciples are looking up and thinking, is he going to come back? And the angels say, what are you doing? Get to work. Go out there and win souls. Do what you're supposed to do. Now he sends them out. And that's what we're supposed to do now. We're not supposed to just be sitting in our chairs at home, comfortable, loving life. We're supposed to be actively winning souls for Christ. And that's what I think about this, what this ministry is here for. And sometimes, even us as in the school, us in the school, it's, it's the same thing as some of the people up here in the, in the church, um, they get paid salaries to work. It's because they're dedicating their lives and they're not doing anything else, really. They're saying, I'm doing this. I'm putting all my time into this. But that's a ministry of this church. I interviewed several students this past summer, and I tell them all that that ministry is a ministry of this ministry. We are not different. We're not separated. We are the same. And I, I encourage all of them, if they don't have a church, come here. If they don't go to church on Wednesday night, come here. This is the ministry, the local body of believers meeting together. And this is the ministry. And all of us should be a part of the ministry of Central Baptist Church in some form or fashion, spreading and encouraging one another. This is our church family. Some of us sing up in choir. Some of us go to Sunday school. Some of us are in the doors. They're welcoming people. Some of us go door to door and they talk to each other. Some of us work in the school. All part of the same ministry. Just spreading God's word. 
And it's, it's a wonderful thing when those children come to know Christ. It's a wonderful thing when we're out door to door and we meet people and we get to just tell them how to be born again. That they can know God and they can know His Son, Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful thing. And, and then come back in and be discipled to grow in the Lord. It's not a one and done. It's accepting Christ and growing. And Paul, throughout this, these books, he's, he's writing to them that they would grow in the Lord, in their knowledge. Not just, not just doing and, and their understanding isn't grown, but that they would understand. And then they would, their faith would be able to grow. And they say, God, I don't, I don't understand all these things. But boy, you are a God that's almighty that I can serve. That first part, that prayer, that thankful that he, that he has for them, for the enduring, for the abounding, for the faith. But then he also says that he's praying always for them. We have prayed for people in this church, and Paul exemplifies that in his own ministry. In verse 11 it says, Wherefore also we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling, and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of, of faith with power. The name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye would be counted worthy. When we're called up, I want to be counted worthy. I don't know what this life holds for me. I, 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 don't, I don't understand everything that, go, that goes on in the world. When I, went to, when I went to college, there was one unique thing that they did there that I appreciated. We didn't dwell, at, my, at the college I went to at PCC, we didn't dwell on every other book that was out there. We didn't, we didn't study all the other authors that are out there. You could. But we, we really studied. What I got out of it was they read God's word and we focused on God and what God's word said. I appreciated that. And I don't understand everything that's in here. But I know that God wants us to get up in the morning and go to work. He wants us to be doing things. And we're on this world for doing. Pastor Andy he mentioned something, and he said that if you're still here, God has something for you to do. And the time that you feel like there is nothing more for me to do, God will take you home. What is our thing that's left here to do? Now, I hit a young age of 30, and all of a sudden I felt like things were creaking more than they should have been. And people feel like, you know what, this is my prime time. I get the weirdest creaks. I feel like I'm getting older. And I'm not there. But I'm the next generation, aren't I? But God, if you're still here in this pew, God has a purpose for you for still being here in this pew. And I don't know what that is. But God wants you to do a work for him. He goes further on, counted worthy. And we'll see a little later on that God doesn't want you to sit still, and that's in chapter 3, but we'll get there. It says in verse 1 of chapter 2, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. The day of Christ. This is the second coming he's referencing here. Apparently, there was a letter, there was news, there was something that came into this church that made this church shaken in their mind. They weren't sure what was going on. They weren't... Sh they, they were uncertain of whether or not Christ, which 
in the first book, the first letter, that Paul had said that Christ was coming back to take his church up, with all this tribulation, all these things that were going on that were bad in their lives, the persecution that was going on, there was confusion and they were thinking, I missed it. We're in the tribulation, is what they were thinking. And the Apostle Paul, because he cares, I think, he writes back and he says, no, 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 no. The tribulation has some clear identifications with it. You have, you're not in the tribulation. If you're in the tribulation, here's some distinctions, distinctions about that. Here's some clear identifications that you can see that this is the tribulation. You have not missed the rapture. And let's look at these things. He's going to talk about this man, this man that is going to be a deceiver, a man of sin, a wicked man. And this man we would de declare as the Antichrist. Let's look at the description of him. He says in verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not, Paul says, remember ye not, in verse 5, that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And, and now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Right there, I believe the thing that's holding him back is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, which lives within us, is keeping back the wicked one. And when God take, comes back, when Christ comes back and doesn't come to the earth, he takes out his church, and his Holy Spirit is removed from this world. And at that point, the devil, the man of perdition, will then be able to do his work. About two weeks ago, no, it was last week, Brother Reuben, right? Brother Reuben had talked about the, the Jehovah's Witness had come to this door. And Jehovah's Witness, they don't understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they, they actually came to my door, too. And I love it when they come, too. Because I just talk to them through and they talk about the gospel, talk about how Christ is going to return, and then how we must be born again, and then I mention that Jesus is the Son of God, and they just start backing up. They start leaving. I don't have to send them away. They send themselves away. It is an enjoyable thing. But I, I was talking with him, and he was, he was out there thinking, and I feel so bad for him. He's thinking that he is trying to usher in the kingdom. He is trying to do good works to thinking that the kingdom of God is going to come down and it's just going to happen and Christ is going to, the kingdom is going to come in and he's working, he's doing good work so that he can be in God's kingdom. But he doesn't know Jesus, who is the only way. He doesn't understand that the church is going to be raptured out. And that man is going to be continuing working and he's going to continue through the tribulation period. He's not going to be taken up. He's going to be continuing through and he's going to come to the point where he has that choice of seeing that God is coming in. And, but he won't have the way. And I think that that man is the one that God will say, I never knew you. You didn't come in the way. Depart from me. And I try to give the gospel to them, but they do run. They do leave. But they don't understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. They don't understand the distinction here and they would be confused. Paul writes, and he wants to clarify with us. He doesn't want any confusion to be there. He doesn't want us to be worried that we have missed the rapture. But the tribulation, and I think in God's grace, is a very short period of time. The whole period is only seven years of tribulation, the great tribulation, although there are, there's a lot that happens. 
it's not forever. God doesn't have us, the world suffer a long period of time. But it is enough. So the world, at the end of it, the world looks, and Israel looks, and they can say when Christ comes back, Israel will say, that's my Messiah. And when you see in the different parts of the Old Testament where it talks about the tribulation period, Christ doesn't come back until his people, the Israelites, recognize that the Antichrist is a false one. And they recognize the true one as being their savior. And then Jesus can come in as his triumphal savior. God's plan all along was that Israel, his people, would look to him as being their savior, their Christ. And that the people of the world would be able to look to him and say, that's God Almighty. And Israel was supposed to take all of them and witness to all of them and say, look at God. And that's our job today. God has set Israel aside for a time. But when he takes us out, he'll reuse Israel again. Right now, it's our job. But here in the passage, he's talking about that wicked one. In verse 9, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all may be damned, who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren. The Apostle Paul wants them to know that this delusion, this period, this man of perdition is in the future. It hasn't happened yet. So that third one, do not be shaken. The point is, do not be shaken in your mind by false doctrine. Stand firm upon God's word. He says it again, therefore in 15, therefore brethren, stand fast. And hold the traditions which have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and God, even our Father, which hath loved us, and that hath given us everlasting consultation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. God wants you to know that you're, you can stand fast in God's word. You can go back and rely upon what you've been taught. Not what man has taught you. But what God has taught you, read his book. Know it. Now, I might explain it. I might preach and proclaim it. But it's God's word. It's not me. It's not you. It's God's word that we're supposed to lean back onto. That's his thing. Don't be soon shaken. Stand fast. He does ask us to pray. Pray for them. Now, I don't believe we can pray for Paul anymore. But when he says these things, I do look back on and say, we're supposed to pray this for, what does he want prayed for? What's he calling on? And we're supposed to use him as an example. He put these words in here for us to be able to follow. And here in this next part, chapter 3, he asks God to continue the work. That the work would not be hindered. Paul just like us today, he had people that were hindering the work. I was reading Acts, and Paul kept on going from city to city. And the people either hated him because he was preaching and taking away from their false gods, or he was taking away from the, the Jewish people and their synagogues, and they were jealous. They were hindering the work. And he says in verse 1 of chapter 3, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may you have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. You see, in this verse, he clarifies, he says, the word of God has been lifted up, has been put in you, and you are following it. I pray that you would pray that the work through me would be done unto all the people, that everybody would understand the word that I am putting out as you have. 
And so as we read this passage later on, understand that that's what he's asking for. That we would pray for one another. That God's work through his word would not be hindered. That we could go out and preach the gospel. We need that in a few weeks. When we start preaching to these kids, there are people who have never heard the gospel. They strictly come here because they don't like the public school. They don't want their kids to be bullied. The story they give is not always because they want the gospel. They go to a different church. They believe another gospel sometimes. We have an opportunity to clarify God's word. And we want them to understand that God loves them. That God sent his son to die for them. They, they can be born again. And that word going out should not be hindered. But we need, just as Paul asked this, we need you to pray for us. It's ineffective to go and take God's word to somebody else if it's being hindered, if their eyes are being darkened. And we need you to pray. If Paul, the apostle Paul, the great Apostle Paul, who brought the gospel to the Macedonians, if he would ask that, how shameful if, if I would not ask you to do the same for me. I'm definitely not him. I'm definitely not as smart and as wise and as learned as he was. Pray for us as we go into the school year. But he continues on. And he says in verse 6, Now we command you, brethren, in the, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and this is really the last point of this book, and then we'll read through it, that you withdraw yourself from every brother that walketh disorderly, walketh disorderly, and not after, after the tradition which ye received of us. And I'll just talk this through with you. The tradition, if you remember in 1 Thessalonians, the tradition was that the Apostle Paul did not come to... Thessalonica, and simply gather money off of them, grow rich. He made tents, he worked hard, and gave the gospel. He was a worker, a hard worker. And he told them back in 1 Thessalonians, this is the second one that they didn't do. Not only did they not understand and fall short on their understanding of Christ and their return, but they fell short in the, the working part. They were not working hard for Christ. And Paul writes back and says, guys, you missed it. You missed it. You're supposed to continue working. I, rem I remember this movie that I watched, and it was Old Yeller. Remember that? Some of you remember that one? And there was this unreliable, lazy man in Old Yeller named Mr. Searcy. Remember him? And this man, he came to this, to this farm, to this ranch, and this lady, who was the mother of the main character, the boy, he, he comes over there to help. And he really doesn't. All he does is talk and eat. And me as a 10-year-old boy watching Old Yeller, I'm thinking that guy is not a man that I want, want to follow. All he does is talk all the time. All he does is eat all the time. Sounds like a Baptist sometimes. But no. <laughs> when there is work to be done, when all the food is... Now this is where it gets it's different. When the, every potluck I've ever been to, when the food's been eaten, we help clean the mess up, right? This guy doesn't. He eats, he talks, and the dishes come out, and he's like, I think I have something else to be. He starts picking up his stuff, heading out, when she asks for help, he offers for help. He says, you need some help? My daughter Elizabeth can help you out. He's more than willing for everybody else to do the work except for himself. Now, I, I would not say that this is a problem that we have at Central Baptist Church. You guys work hard. There's, there's, I can't really look out here and say there's anybody in here that doesn't work hard. But this is an admonition that Paul put out and says, Brethren, do not be lazy. Do not sit there and hold your hands waiting for the return of Christ. Go out there and win souls for Christ. Go out there and do the work. Go out there and work. Just as Paul had worked. Don't be lazy. 
don't be a Mr. Searcy, get to work. And even here at CBC, find a place to serve. If you're not plugged in somewhere, if you find you have some free time and there's a ministry need, get plugged in. There are so many ministries here. And this is one of the things that I say that brought me here to CBC. I went to Pensacola Christian College and I went to Campus Church, which was a great church. But a person who wants their family to serve and who wants to serve, it, there are so many people there that it's, it's hard to get involved. I came here because I could get involved. But I believe it's because God wants us to be involved. Be involved. Get to work. God wants us to endure to the very end. He wants us to be thankful. He wants us to pray for one another. He wants us to work hard. He wants us to steady our faith in him and, and it, know that Christ is coming back for his church and that he is coming back to judge this world of all of their sins they've committed. But we don't have to be at that judgment. We're going to be at the judgment where God discerns our works, good and bad, and he, hopefully, we will be able to kneel at his feet and he'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Before I close, let's go ahead and read this book. And it's a good letter. In chapter 1, it said, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, under the church of, of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, grace unto you. And peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure which is manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall come, except shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with, yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in, in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, 
that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle, now our Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work and word. Finally, brethren, pray for us, that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you, that ye both do and will do the thing which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God, into the patient working for Christ. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye you withdraw yourself from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed, yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. The salutations of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The reading of God's word is important to us. We have to endure to the end. We have to work hard. We have to know that Christ is coming back for his church and that he will. He will judge them. And so let's keep working. Let's keep doing the work of the Lord. Let's keep striving. Let's stand fast. Let's pray.